Today you'll hear from Phil Hayde, the co-founder and CEO of Public Inc., an innovative agency that has redefined how corporations engage with social issues. With a career spanning over two decades, Phil has collaborated with leading brands like Johnson & Johnson, Starbucks, and many, many more, helping them navigate and amplify their social impact. As a passionate advocate for the B Corp movement, Phil believes in harnessing business as a force for good, integrating social benefits into core strategies. And since founding Public in 2008, he has driven the agency to, to disrupt traditional thinking, proving that social and environmental impact can be key drivers to profit with purpose. Under his leadership, Public has worked with premier clients like RBC, Canadian Tire, and Maple Leaf Foods, and he is also a regular contributor to Fast Company. I can't wait for you to have a listen, and I'll hand it off to Phil. Phil up. Welcome to the How I Became podcast. I am so honored to be having you as a guest today and being able to hear a little bit of your story, um, the company story, and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Thanks so much. Great, great to be with you, Kelly. Excited to, to join you. Um, so, uh, so I am the founder and CEO of Public. I uh, started the company back in 2008, uh, literally two weeks after Lehman Brothers collapsed. So my timing was impeccable. Uh, and the idea for the company then, as it is now, was to think about what we call profit with purpose. So it was all about how do we get companies to embed social and environmental impact at the heart of their business. Um, and that was an idea that has currency today, but back in 2008, and especially when the market was imploding, it was a really, really tough sell. But the whole impetus was that I really believe fundamentally that if we are going to transform capitalism, essentially, if we're going to transform the way we operate as a society to tackle the major problems we have environmentally and socially, we couldn't look to philanthropy and just charitable activity as a solution to it, that we really needed to harness the power of business to really solve those those problems, not exclusively without the support of government and nonprofit, but the companies had to take a massive role in, in creating that change. And that wasn't going to happen if they couldn't profit from it. And so that's what propelled me back in 2008 to start the company. And it's still what motivates us today. It's so fascinating, especially today versus when you started in 2008, very different landscapes. But how did you believe in the idea or that problem statement then when it wasn't necessarily very clear or very obvious to companies like you had to do a lot of convincing of yeah. the problem which i think a lot of founders would turn you know shy away from something where the problem isn't obvious to the to the audience that they're trying to target yeah it's a great question um the impetus for the idea was uh, probably around 2004 2005 um, where I was, a job that I had before I started public, we were creating like corporate social responsibility strategies, programs for companies. Right. And what I found was that like, uh, no matter how much success we had, at the end of the day, we would say, great, we've had all the success with the program. Let's talk about next year. How could we, could we double the budget or could we at least look at it, you know, a 20%, a 30% increase. And what was happening was um, our clients at the time were saying, uh, super happy with the work, but no, of course, we're not going to increase the budget. Or if they did, it was incremental because, you know, the company had grown X, but it wasn't, they weren't really willing to think about how they could 2X or 3X uh, their commitments and their impact because it was seen as a offset and nice to do to the business, right? It wasn't driving the business. So that was the impetus to say that just can't, that just can't be the way forward. Um what was difficult when I started public was that trying to convince people of this idea to your question. And what I found happened is I usually got one of three responses from senior executives. I got the, what you're saying about this profit with purpose idea, it just feels wrong because we shouldn't be benefiting from doing what's right and charitable. And I was like, uh. I get it, but you're thinking in charitable terms, I'm talking about impact and business strategy. And so they just couldn't, wrap their heads around it. They're like, they were just very much old school. We make our money on this side of the equation, then we create a foundation, right? And we give a certain amount of money back to community. That's all they Almost do. like you feel bad that you're benefiting from doing something good. 
Like yeah. you shouldn't expect a return. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, you had some who were like knew that they weren't doing good things, and so it was an offset for others. It's just like it's part of what you do to be a good corporate citizen. And, right. But it wasn't. You know, it was totally separate from the business for the most part. So you had one camp of executives who were like, "I don't agree with this. You shouldn't be profiting from doing charitable activity." And I kept saying, "We're not talking about charitable activity." Per se. So that was one camp. You had a second camp who said, this is a really interesting idea, but I just can't be seen in the market to be saying this. Like, I just think that would be problematic. Hmm. So they just, so they were open to the idea, but just didn't, you know, just didn't think they could. And then you had a third camp um, who was basically saying, I really like what you're on. Like, I think you're onto something. I think this is really interesting. However, I am not being judge like i'm not being evaluated i'm not being compensated uh by doing this and so therefore it's a nice to do not a need to do and i'm too busy so please go away and it was really one of those three kind of reactions and so it was a constant i mean i found like literally for three four five years i was just every meeting was an education about a not talking about philanthropy we're talking about how this is part of the business and then trying to convince. And of course, what people will ask you if they're skeptical is, well, prove to me it works, right? Show me the examples. But when you're trying to introduce an idea that doesn't have currency yet, it's hard, right? You, so I could point to, you know, Dove already existed, right? And of course, the body shop was around and Lush and, you know, Newman's own. So it's very difficult to convince people of something when you can't point to countless examples in the marketplace. But what I find in Canada in particular is that new ideas um, that haven't been proven, there's, we have so much risk aversion in this country that they're just not willing to try. Like they're not excited to be first. At least in the mm -hmm. US, I find there's more appetite, more desire to, to be first. It's just in the cultural, you know, uh, orientation of the country. Whereas in Canada, we are so risk averse. So it was a really, really tough sell for a number of years. A couple episodes ago, Laura Gabor was on on the podcast and they're in the middle of raising for their company. And she was saying she experienced the exact same things in the US, very open to talking like ideas, like the problem set. And Canadians, from her experience, are really looking to dot every I and cross. They need to know every single detail so that there's like no risk in investing, which like right. actually right. there there it is. So yeah. it's it's funny that you even experienced that when you were starting your business in a totally different world. Like it wasn't looking for VC, you were looking for your clients, but experienced a similar um element of our culture, our natural culture here. I think it's a big I think it's a big problem overall. It's certainly in the kind of impact purpose space, I think it's a it's a big problem because so often you know, you need to lead with your beliefs and your values, and then you just go and make it happen. Right. I mean, that, that's true of entrepreneurship overall, but it's, it's really true in this space. And so it, it's problematic. I, I once gave a talk um, to the AFP, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, and, I, and the presentation I gave was called The Race to be Third. And it was why Canadians, you know, nonprofits and, and for-profits, but like to be third to market with something. Right? You don't want to be first because that's way too risky. And even second, there's only one person's gone ahead of you. So once once everyone's proven it, then you go into the market. Um, and I was trying to, and then of course what I did was talk about why we have to shift that and like here are examples of people who've gone ahead. <laughs> when I got the evaluation back, you know, everyone hated my presentation. It was so no. because I think it was too on the nose. And they're like, who's this guy thumbing his, you know, <laughs> himself at, at, at these Canadians? But I think I still think it stands true. And I, I I just constantly frustrated by the lack of courage to uh, push the needle and to think about how we advance these issues in a way that'll drive the business. And, um, you know, we're just we're just so risk averse in this country. And I think it, it really holds us back from being excellent. Going back to pre starting the company when you were younger, you had obviously you you weren't that risk averse like you saw an opportunity and you were a first mover with it um what inspired you to want to change the world or want to make you know um profit with perfect purpose uh you know have currency when what was that inspiration yeah. um 
I wish I could tell you that I had some epiphany, you know, some beautiful, magical moment that I could create a beautiful TV spot about. I was just sort of pre-built this way. And so my orientation has always been to an interest in uh, how change happens, how to create social change and environmental change. It's just sort of how I'm built. I'll tell you the very short version of this story. Uh, I was traveling through Asia with a very dear buddy of mine. I had finished my undergrad in political theory. And I had, I mean, I read Marx, I read Nietzsche, I read Engels. I mean, I read, so I was like very influenced by, I was never a Marxist, but just very influenced by um, democratic socialism. And my close buddy was, had studied economics and, you know, was very progressive, but was more, more right wing than I. And, and we started our travels. We landed in Hong Kong and we traveled through China. Uh, and by the time we got to Nepal, you know, this is like now six months into travel. And I was shocked by what I saw, by the way, in China. This is, I'm an old man now. So this was a long time ago. And China was so capitalist. I couldn't believe it, it was like the wild west of capitalism. So that was like, wow, theory and practice are completely misaligned. But all through this trip, I'm like spouting what I've read in school and so on. And my, my good friend, he's just such a, you know, such a good person. He was putting up with me. <laughs> Fast forward, we get to Nepal. And so six months of me just hammering him with all my, my political ideologies. And we were trekking through Nepal, this Annapurna circuit, it's about a three month, three week trek. And the last day you go through, you climb about a thousand meters and then you descend into a valley about 1600. It's a massive day. It's an incredible day. And it's a very, very long day. So finally, we're on the way down into this village and we get to the tea house. Uh, and it's a, we've literally been tracking about 14, 15 hours and you're Oof. exhausted. And the person uh, who led us to our room said, can I get you anything? So we said, oh, we'd love you know, a cup of Coca-Cola's. We needed some sugar. <laughs> and we like, we're lying in the bed and we get the little bottles of Coca-Cola and we'd like down it. And it was like the most incredible like moment. I was so happy to have that Coca-Cola and it was like giving me energy again. I turned to my ad. buddy. <laughs> I turned to my buddy and I say, God bless the multinationals. <laughs> and it was like literally in that moment that I became a capitalist again. And so I think, you know, I tell you the story because as, as I think my evolution from kind of, you know, hardcore kind of social change, a little bit more lefty to really trying to to, to push an agenda around conscious capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, right? And that positive economy, my evolution has been where I've, I've always been interested in social change, but I really fundamentally believe, and I think that moment in Nepal had an impact on me, that the way we're going to transform is we have to transform capitalism. It's the, it's the best of the worst systems we have. There's so much good in it, but that we are as citizens, as consumers, we have consumption societies. And so we have to transform how we do consumption. And so, you know, the reason I actually called the agency Public Inc. was that I really wanted to bring the consumer and the citizen and the employee together as one where, you know, the ink in public was that when we can transform the way people behave and you can be as much of a citizen as you can a consumer in a moment and we can get you to do the right thing just by living your life. I think my evolution has constantly been about how do we do this by playing with the levers of, you know, of capitalism to make it a more positive thing, because I haven't seen another economic system that has worked better. But right. of course, capitalism is flawed. And so that's been, for me, that was always the impetus um, for why I created Public and for the work that we do. Uh, and philosophically, how we try to just work with companies and engage them to move them along the spectrum to being more conscious, to being more uh, progressive, right? To balance profit and, you know, purpose. Well, um, you, you've mentioned... Um previously about growing up with both Jewish and Catholic guilt and how this yeah, has shaped your yeah. identity. And I'm curious, growing up, what elements of that you do you think has not necessarily led you to start the company, but driven who you are and therefore you then created Public Inc. But like, what, yeah. how did that experience influence you? Yeah, I would say probably twofold. One is that I grew up in a very kind of liberal Jewish household, like mm -hmm. very kind of, um, and... Um, we grew up, as I say, kind of cultural Jews as opposed to overly religious Jews. Um, and, but we did sort of take some of the cultural elements 
that I guess my mom in particular really liked. So we did Shabbat every Friday night. And that was more of a cultural moment for us. And it was a religious moment, even though we did the candles and, um, and said the prayers. Um, and, but what it was, was a moment of the week when my mom worked full time, my parents separate when I was young and she worked around the clock. So Friday night we came together and we just sat around the table and would often have uh, friends of my, my mom and my stepdad come over and we would literally spend two, three hours at the dinner, dining room table and talk about issues. Yeah. So that was a big part of my, my upbringing. Um, and what's interesting is there's actually data now to show that uh, families who actually talk politics, talk issues, societal issues at the dinner room, dining room table, you see a much higher level of civic engagement, which is, you know, not some big aha, it seems obvious, but it, there's actually been research to, to prove that out. And so that was a big part of my upbringing. It was about talking about issues and ideas um, in the world. And so I would say the cultural side, the sort of religious, the Jewish side, um, was both in the, those, those traditions, but there's also, um, you know, within Judaism, right, there's this, this idea of tikkun olam, right, which is about healing the world, as you know. And I don't know, that's always stuck with me, that there is a responsibility as Jews, but I think it's just as a humanist, to um, look out for others, right, and to think about how to improve things, not just for yourself, but for those around you, for your community and for the broader community. And so that was a big part of our upbringing. And it wasn't force fed with like this sort of stern, like, you know, um, austere kind of, you need to be responsible. It was just sort of, it was just part of like, you know, it was in the water as, it, as, we, as I said. Totally. So, yeah. so that was, that was a big, big part that, you know, the Catholic part when we were doing, you know, talking <laughs> about this before the, for the, the podcast was, I joke that's why I'm so screwed up because like I was a little Jewish boy in a Catholic school because it, when I grew up, the place to learn French was it was the Catholic, it was the nuns who were who were teaching. Um, but I think what I learned from that was uh, as strict as they were, they were incredibly kind, incredibly just people. Um, and I think that a lot of the lessons about um, social justice um, and about, you know, treating you know, those the way you'd want to be treated. Um, and some of the amazing parts of the Catholic tradition and religion that have, you know, the social justice elements and, and the values definitely is part of my upbringing as well. And then, of course, the guilt is just you can't help it. If you're a Jewish mother, you just have to imbue guilt on your on your family. Um, of course. But it, um, but I do think that formative, like from my education to what we did around the din you know, dining room table, um, really sort of just informed my sense of kind of the world and being curious about the world and how other people live. And I'd say the last thing I'll just say to you is, um, you know, my mom is a psychologist, my sister's a psychologist, my other sister is a guidance counselor. And, so, and my stepdad was a therapist. So like, it was, that's why I'm so crazy. I was, you know, surrounded by all these therapists and I'm the black sheep. But what was interesting, you know, jokes aside was a lot of our conversations were around trying to understand why people act the way they do. And one of the lessons that I grew up with was, um, you know, people, everybody has a certain amount of crazy in them. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean that as a mental illness kind of thing, just like, you know, we're all- Life. Mm -hmm. Life and our pathologies are all, um, you know, different varieties of of from very sane to quite quite crazy. But the lesson that I received always was about not trying to default to the judgment of how people act, what they say, what they do, but to get curious about why. And I think that's always stayed with me because I think the more curious we can be about how people think and act. And when you travel the world, you realize people really think and act differently. Like it's not, you know, a North American mindset, which of course isn't even a homogenous sense. But when you look at the way people live in China and in Indonesia and, or, you know, in the Middle East, or in, I mean, it's very, very different. And so I think you have to take your kind of cultural reference. Uh, uh, you have to sort of suspend it a little bit. And I think learning and getting curious about why people think the way they do, why they act the way they do, as opposed to jumping right to, I like that, I don't like that, and judging um, is something we could all learn a lot more from. I still, I mean, as a human being, I still judge, right? But I think that was a big part of my upbringing. And it really helps in the work that we do because all of our work is about how to create 
social change and do it within the levers of economics of, of capitalism. But you have to understand that everybody operates and thinks differently. So how do you get inside that? How do you get curious? What attitude and what behavioral buttons do you push in an audience to get them to take some form of pro-social action? I can trace that all the way back to growing up and the conversations we had around the din dining room table. It's so fascinating and growing up and, and still now every, every Friday night dinner, we have our Shabbat and I take the same things away. It's a lot of, you have your whole adult family around you, especially like growing up and you hear one, how to have discussions, how to argue different perspectives, different pieces coming in and it allows you to kind of start to form your own opinions or, um, be able to ask why and then you know it comes to the the four the you know the four whys that we always ask yeah. and i love the idea that everything is questioning and being curious and even um i went to jewish school in the evenings like hebrew school um mm -hmm. and part of everything we learned is question the religion like question every element of it and then decide for yourself how you want to believe in it or how you want to incorporate it into your life um, but funny enough, parallel to you, I went to an Anglican school. So we mm. did all the, and we were more conservative, but just happenstance, I went to an Anglican school, but my mom would still send me with a Sidur and like a, you know, yeah, Bible sure. for those that don't know. And, and I think for me, that also taught me like being different is okay. Like I would go in there and everyone was reading the hymn book, but she wanted me, even though being part of the environment and they loved the school and what I was learning there to still keep an element of who I am and stand out a little bit. Like it's okay yeah. to be different. Um, yeah. And even that, I think um, those elements of being different, I'm sure you felt that as well, pushes you to be it more risk, not less risk averse. You have, you have to be okay with it because you were kind of naturally pushed into that direction. And I'm curious if that, if you think about those elements and it helped you want to do something that was a little bit different or a little bit outside of the norm to build the company as well. Yeah, it's a really, it's an excellent question. You know, I don't actually know. Um, I think there's no question in my mind that subconsciously that's the case. Mm -hmm. You know, from a conscious level, is that what drove me? Like when I think about starting public and kind of taking the leap I my kids were two and four at the time and so you know it's doing that and not having you know the guarantee it's going to work and obviously the revenue and you know you've got young kids it's 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 can be it can be quite scary um i think the leap that i took had a lot more to do with an experience i had when i was doing my master's degree yeah then sort of the your point about sort of being different. Cause I certainly had the same experience. I, you know, at a Catholic school and like around the holidays, as an example, like, you know, these Christian, you know, these Christmas um, programs and it was just really religious. And I was right. just like, what is this? Right. right. Um, but I respect it. It was just, it was just different. But I think yeah. what allowed me to take the leap to entrepreneurialism was more about knowing that um, if I take the leap, I will be just fine. And if it doesn't work out, I will be just fine, right? And having that resilience to, to know that. And the very short story there was when I was doing my master's, um, I was running out of money. I just didn't have enough money to finish. And I just didn't, you know, my parents weren't really in a position to help me. I mean, if push came to shove, they probably would have. Right. But I felt like I was old enough that I had to kind of figure this out for myself. Um, and I figured it out, I got a job and I figured it out and I finished it. And, but it was when I was literally counting my pennies going, how am I going to get through this month and then pay my rent? And I didn't have a handout from anybody. And I went and I figured it out. That's when I, that's when I said to myself for the rest of my life, I know I can take care of myself, that financially I can always, I will find a way. And I think that actually was the moment that I realized later that I can take this leap. And honestly, in my business, at every stage of growth, when I've taken the leap and outside the parameters of comfort, because you have to live with discomfort, it's that having the resilience to know you'll just figure it out. But if you haven't had that experience at some point in your life, and particularly in your formative years, um, it's really hard to do that. And I think that is, um, without getting too philosophical, but I think one of the challenges today is that parents want to solve their kids' problems. And it's a real big mistake because you're not teaching your kids about resilience. 
they're not a they will not become entrepreneurs because they won't know that they can take care of it themselves right and mm -hmm. it's coming from a good place but it's actually count it's counterintuitive and it's actually detrimental so for me being able to take that leap had so much to do with figuring out how to stand on my own two feet how do i pay for this um how do i make my way in the world without hoping that mom and dad are going to take care of me um and it's has served me so well yeah it's um i am curious to see in the you know next 10 15 years as the next generation who maybe has had more of a hands-on parenting approach um what innovation and what disrupt disruption looks like in the coming years um i also think in boomer generation and and a little bit after them it was a necessity a lot of people went into entrepreneurship right. because they didn't have another option so how does that shift when boomers are now transitioning their wealth to the younger generation and maybe it's not as much of a necessity as it once was yeah it's a it's a really fascinating and and who knows how it's going to shake out like mm -hmm. do um you know countries people in countries and economies that are uh that are more developing, do they actually have the huge leg up because they weren't totally. called in the same way than, than in North America? But who's to say that it, it could be the opposite, right? Yeah. I don't think we know. I think that um, what we are seeing, of course, is that even if you are taking that leap, if you aren't equipped with those skills and taught those skills or learning those skills on your own, um, you know, the, the increase in anxiety and depression and mental and just the variety of mental health challenges we're seeing it, we're seeing it in youth, we're seeing it in the population overall. And I think it's, it's way too simplistic to suggest that it's that they didn't get that resilience when they were young, but it certainly is a piece of the puzzle, right? right. And what we need, whether you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, you know, we need people to get more comfortable with ambiguity, right? To, to know that not everything's gonna be spoon fed to them and to go and try to figure things out. And, and I'm a big believer that making things up right that didn't exist before like that's the ex like it's not for everybody but that's the exciting part and so you got to just forge your path and you can't be afraid to fail but if you haven't been equipped with the skills to do that it's easy to say and hard to do totally i want to i want to switch gears a little bit you mentioned like the exciting part and looking at the we've talked a little bit about the evolution of maybe entrepreneurship or yeah. uh, what that looks like but what about the evolution of marketing itself and knowing where where it was in 2008 when you started the company to where it is today what what has stood out to you in the evolution of marketing and people's response to purpose driven marketing yeah it's been it's a really interesting evolution if we take actually the period from 2000 to where we are today so the last 24 years um you know the space has really evolved right because in the early days in 2000 for the most part, marketing and social purpose didn't really go together, right? For the most part. I mean, I, there's yeah. lots of examples of where it did, but it was very much about doing the philanthropic thing. And then, you know, you would communicate it. But a lot of the communication way, way back was like check writing. Like, the, you know, remember those big massive checks, you know, and like the big, and then the press release was about how much money was given. And it was all right. about the amount of money. Um, if you think about the evolution, it went from that to when the marketers started thinking about how do we, you know, and, and the birth of cause marketing. And it was really about how do we merge, you know, a message and an idea to our consumer with something that is philanthropic. And so you saw a lot of these kind of cause marketing programs. And so you start seeing the birth of like, would you, you know, the point of sale, would you like to add a dollar to your bill? Right. So all that started because you because rightfully the both. The, the nonprofits and the for-profits realized there's a lot of money that can be made. And right. you saw things like, how do we tie product to it, right? So like Red, if you, I don't know if you remember Red, that was created, I, I know. Well, so it's, again, you know, totally fine because it's not really, it still exists, but it's not a thing like it used to be. But um, Bono and Oprah and um, this organization that became Red, literally launched this idea where you they created this thing called product red and they basically created a brand all to combat hiv aids tuberculosis malaria uh, but mostly are on hiv aids and then they got brands so they got converse and they got gap and they got like uh, uh absolute vodka and they got a credit card company 
And basically you get these product red. So you'd still buy your Converse, but the red Converse. So you bought the red. Oh, I do iPod. remember that. Yes. And it was like in brackets with red. Correct. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So like that was a big deal in around 2000, right. 2004, 2005. So that, that really accelerated the whole product marketing around mm -hmm. this. The evolution continues because then all of a sudden the idea of being purposeful, right? So all of a sudden you have all these companies who are now talking about brand purpose and they're injecting some social purpose into it. Um, and I would say that, you know, it was with good intent, but a lot of it was pretty uh, performative in the sense that they weren't doing anything underneath it. They were just, the marketers got very savvy at talking about purpose messaging because it was new and novel and it, it, you know, it, it was very emotional. And so you sort of saw that um, and then it continues to evolve, right? And so you sort of evolve from that to now thinking about, well, how do we market our sustainability across the board? Right. Um, and and so of course, now you start seeing all kinds of marketing communication um, all around what companies are doing, both internally and externally to have an impact uh, in the world. And trying to use that in some cases directly as a competitive advantage, including product sale, and in other cases, the way to recruit and retain talent, right? And so there's been this interesting evolution, I think, where we are today, um, which is challenging for, I think, businesses like mine is there was so much heat around sort of purpose and, and sort of the marketing of impact sort of between, you know, late 2020, essentially after the murder of George Floyd unfortunately, mm -hmm. and then through to 2023, so much energy around being purposeful. And then of course, you know, ESG rises out of, you know, basically the financial sector kind of appropriated, you know, the sustainability idea um, for better and for worse. And so there's all this energy, but now with, I would say both the macroeconomic trends where the economy is in a, you know, in a tougher spot. And then you have a lot of the pushback and the politicization, like we're seeing these things like, you know, go woke, go broke, and all of this sort of pushback that somehow if you are diverse and equitable and inclusive in your business practices and your employee hiring, that all of a sudden that's become a bad thing. And so it's been a really interesting evolution from like doing this as a nice offset or like feeling good halo to actually seeing it as something that could actually drive the business to now a little bit of reticence on, you know, being careful because they're worried that they're going to get pushback and backlash from, you know, other consumer audience and employee, et cetera. It's been a really interesting evolution. And we're certainly trying to continue to push um, the envelope and really guide our clients on bringing that authenticity and transparency to it. But it's, it's been a, a crazy ride actually. I was going to say the authenticity as you were talking to talking through it, I think is such a big piece because I, from some of the campaigns that I've seen that have gotten a lot of backlash, it, it feels like they're doing it to force fit a good movement into it. And whether it's because they want to start to be more inclusive or more fill in the blank, um, or they're doing it because they think it's the way because they're buying into purpose driven marketing, but doing it in a inauthentic way. Um, yeah. But what is it, ideally from from public? But what is a campaign that you're really proud of, or that you really stands out to you as as successfully demonstrating the value of it? Yeah, I'm. You know, something that we did that I'm very proud because it actually has a sort of a longer tail on it. Um, I, there's two that come immediately to mind. So one is uh, we actually worked with the Body Shop a few years back. I mean, so they've been, I mean, you know, when you think about the body shop, you think about animal testing, like from way mm -hmm. back, right? And they brought back this campaign, or they brought back the issue, they've always been working on it, but to try to actually get a global ban on animal testing. And so, um, you know, the, the head office in, in, in the UK sort of had this campaign called Forever Against Animal Testing. We were hired by the Canadian team, and we were given a certain amount of latitude to think about how to shape it. Mm -hmm. People are busy, right? And it's not that they don't care, but on a relative basis. And so we found we often talk about like the side door into issues. And so for us, when we started to research it, we realized that like 60% of Canadians um, have a pet. And so we're like, why don't we go through the love of your pet as a way to you know tackle the issue of animal testing? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked unbelievably. So, you know, we got a little cute. I mean, it was like the pet titian and such, but like we, the things that we did though, is 
we crafted the whole campaign around sort of animal influencers and just the whole thing was around love of your pet. And we showed up at like Dogapalooza and the whole bit. We tied the kind of social impact side of it to the business. Okay. And so how do we actually get people into store? How do we tie it to product, right? So to really close the loop to make it profit with purpose. Um, and we did Days on the Hill where we were advocating for it and targeting members of parliament who had, you know, had pets and so on. Why I'm proud about it, and Body Shop deserves so much credit, and they worked with a great um, government relations firm as well. They actually got finally a ban in this country on animal testing. And so, you know, what I love about that example was that it wow. was they had they long term. Like they led they did. the actual full. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Did. Uh, with a nonprofit partner, but mm -hmm. Body Shop deserves a ton of credit. So they finally got a ban on animal testing. So what I love about that example is we were able to find like a creative marketing way to engage audiences in it, tie it to the business, right? Make it relevant to people as opposed to saying animal testing is bad. Because most most animal testing kind of campaigns were either shock and horror, like show the mutilize, you know, mutilation of animals, or it was like super cute. And it just like was easy to ignore. So we found a way to make it relevant to our audience. We tied it to the business and then they stuck with it. Um, and so it had, you know, it had the advocacy, it had the educate education, it had the marketing, it had the business benefit attached to it, um, and was really, really successful. So to me, that's like a perfect example of when we talk about profit with purpose, we're trying to merge business interests, societal interests, and do it in a way where the consumer and the citizen become one, and everyone can truly benefit in the, you know, in the initiative. In that example, what was was there a goal of like increased profit margin or increased revenue or in, like did they have a PL line that they were looking for out of this or brand awareness brand trust and when a company is bringing a team like yours on is there like a specific theme that they're looking to achieve or a north star that they're looking to achieve in a campaign like that yeah i would say um Sometimes, yes, some, there's always something they're trying to achieve. Sometimes mm -hmm. the metrics are more defined than others. We're always pushing to define the metrics as much as possible because, you know, it's easy to fall in love with your creative idea. And if you get lots of like uh, media attention for you, you think it's a success, but that's not really, I mean, that's right. a metric of success, but it's not the ultimate metric. What I can tell you is we activated in store over the course of a year and a half. Um, first time was uh, five weeks, sorry, six weeks. And the second time was five weeks. And we saw a 17 and 15% increase in sales. So, so we were wow. measuring it, but they didn't set the goal. They say, hey, we need to get at least a 10%. And part of the reason we saw that increase in sales year over year from the previous, obviously from the previous year in that month, was because in the past, when they would do social issue campaigns, they never tied it to the business. Mm -hmm. And so by tying it to the business, we were able to achieve the, the dual, you know, dual objectives and dual outputs. So there's a whole range that we actually try to map because the more that we can actually get really tangible on both the business um, outputs that we're trying to create and the societal ones, it gives us a much more honest appraisal of did the campaign work or not. There's so much more that I want to talk about, but I know we are at our last few minutes. My second last question, um, I think as founders there's or entrepreneurs, there's so many myths that we're told when we're starting a business, the list is endless. So I'm curious mm -hmm. if there's something that you have heard as you started your business that you would want to dispel for future entrepreneurs. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, I'll actually tell you... Uh, I don't know if it's a myth or not, but a, a myth that I actually think is true. Okay. Know, so maybe I'm, I'm like twisting, <laughs> your, twisting your question, but it's what comes to mind. Um, when I started out, I was told, especially if you're building something from scratch and you're not like super well capitalized, right? Because that's an important, uh, important variable here that you should expect that it's going to take 10 years to build. Right. I was told that by a number of people and one person in particular and I remember having a drink with her. She, she runs a very successful PR shop. And she said to me, 10 years. And I remember when she told me that, I thought, oh, God, I really hope not. I thought, I think it's a I long do... time. I said, I thought, I think I, could... I was only in year two. I'm like, I think I can do it in five, you know, the hubris of, of an entrepreneur. And um, nope, it took 10 years, you know. Uh, and, 
and so I, I say that because I think, um, you know, entrepreneurs are so passionate about what they do and believe so much in what they are trying to create. And you think it's always going to happen faster than it does, but it really does take a long time to build. It's no one wants to bet on the new thing. They want to bet on the sure thing. And mm-hmm. so I do think as a, as a myth, but it has certainly in my experience, at least i uh, play it out, which is it really does take a decade to build. But the biggest predictor of success is your will and determination. And I have found that to be really true, at least in my experience, where, you know, the idea I had for for public was way ahead of the market. Um, and we could have folded the tent so many times. And the only reason we didn't was I so believed in this idea and I was just stubborn and just like pushed and persevered. And I think that, you know, 90% of success is showing up and pushing through it. And I think, you know, you hear that a lot and it sounds sort of like trite, but, you know, it is a true myth that it is so much about the effort and the perseverance and how badly you want it. That's what drives the, the entrepreneur more than anything. And, pro- and, and I mean, that lends itself right to the, the, that 10 year mark, right? Like you, it, that's a long time to, to keep driving forward. Yeah. Um, I'd love to dig so much into this, but one question I'll ask around, around the 10 year, what, what was it? Like, I'm sure you had successes along the way. So when you say 10 years to build, what happened in that 10th year or, you know, around there that made you feel, oh yeah, now, now I get it. Now I feel secure. Now we have a company. I, I think in my case, cause obviously everyone's case is going to be different. And also of course. Is, is your business a product or is it a service? So obviously we're in the service business, but um, I think what it was is it established a level of credibility and experience where people, where I had enough case studies and people were like, they're legitimate, they're real. There's enough yeah. people who would vouch for us. You know, so word of mouth is obviously the best kind of marketing you could do. And so at the 10 year mark, you've, you've uh, accumulated um, enough experience, enough uh, examples, and you've been around long enough where you kind of seen a lot and you can weather certain like, you know, the little storms and the big storms. Last question. If you were to say how I became, how Philip became dot, 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 fill in the blanks with where you are currently, how would you name your episode? Yeah. Geez, that's a, such a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I kind of toss between two. One is how I became a better leader. Because I really, you know, we don't have time on this podcast, but, you know, there's been a really interesting ev- evolution in my leadership and and I reference all the mistakes I've made. But like, you know, you know, you don't get taught how to be a leader. And so, mm-hmm. you you know, a lot of it's trial and error uh, and it's easy to be great when things are good. But it's, it's you know, the, the measure is how good are you when things are bad? And so how I became a better leader was so much in this journey. But the other is how how I became a social entrepreneur, because, you know, this has been it continues to be an evolution of believing in an idea, believing in a vision about how we transform an economy to make it more just and more socially equitable and and more sustainable. And that's, you know, that story is only, you know, half written. So it'd probably be one of one of those two. I really appreciate your time and I can't wait to share this episode out. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate you inviting me on.